Usher explica que... Usher explains that the resurgence of banking in these cities during the late Middle Ages resembled what we saw in the last example. In the beginning, banks acted legitimately and maintained a 100% reserve ratio. But soon, they began to violate general legal principles and appropriate a portion of deposits. They began to operate with a fractional reserve ratio. Usher even found documentary evidence that the Taula de Canvi, Barcelona's municipal bank, operated with a reserve ratio of one-third. In other words, it held one-third and it appropriated the other two-thirds in order to lend them. According to Usher, the first banking activity in history, therefore, was the creation of deposits from nothing based on a fractional reserve ratio. And it was not the issue of paper money or bank bills, in other words, false deposit certificates, that banking activity would be discovered much later, in the 17th century. The most profitable, illegitimate banking activity is the appropriation of site or demand deposits made with bankers. Usher analyzes the bubbles that formed, the crises and financial recessions that hit, and then the privileges the authorities ultimately granted banks, permitting them to operate with a fractional reserve. However, history is very curious, especially in the case of banking in Barcelona. A look at banking in Catalonia in the 14th century reveals that authorities did attempt to ensure compliance with general legal principles and make sure bankers respected the money of their depositors. The Usos de Barcelona in the 13th century was, so to speak, the first commercial code based on rules which had developed spontaneously in dealings between different traders. It was formulated around the year 1300 to 1301. It established that any banker who was unable to return immediately upon request his depositor's deposits would be vilified throughout Barcelona by a public crier and forced to live on a strict diet of bread and water until he returned the last monetary unit deposited. Well, what this rule from the Usos de Barcelona was saying in the year 1300 was that a town crier would publicly proclaim all over the city of Barcelona that Mr. So-and-so, banker, had been dishonest, had appropriated a portion of what he had received on deposit, had been unable to return it and had been sentenced to a strict diet of bread and water. He would be allowed nothing more than that, bread and water, until he returned the deposits. Though the measure was highly commendable, it apparently did not have the desired effects, and a few years later the regulations were completed, and bankers who had obtained collateral and guarantees were required to use a tablecloth to distinguish themselves from those who lacked collateral and guarantees. So, when you went to the banker's quarter to make a deposit, if you saw a banker with a tablecloth, you knew he had sureties, collateral and guarantees, and was therefore more solvent than one who did not have a tablecloth. It was a way of giving information to customers. And woe to anyone who put out a tablecloth without having collateral and guarantees. But even so, it appears that the desired effects were not entirely achieved, because 20 years later, on August the 14th, 1321, the laws were made even more stringent. It was established that if a banker did not return, demand or cite deposits, he would be declared bankrupt. And if he did not return all deposits within one year, that was the time allowed him, he would fall into public disgrace, which would be proclaimed throughout Catalonia by the town crier. Immediately afterward, the banker would be beheaded. His head would be cut off directly in front of his counter, and his property would be sold locally whatever was left of it, to fulfill his obligations as far as possible. There is written evidence that one banker, oh, poor bankers, one Francesc Castello was beheaded right in front of his bench in the year 1360, in accordance with the law. There are records and historical studies of two very significant bubbles 
formed by the process of expansion which fractional reserve banking causes. The most important of these has been studied by Carlo Maria Cipolla, who considers the emergence of banking in Florence. Starting in the 14th century, bankers began to make fraudulent use of part of the money placed on demand deposit with them. And thus, they began to create money out of thin air. An artificial economic boom resulted. But sooner or later, a collapse of confidence and a severe financial crisis followed. People went to withdraw their deposits and found they were gone. This crisis was triggered by England's inability to repay its loans, the public debt issued by the Kingdom of England, which suspended payments. As a result, all banks systematically failed between 1341 and 1346. At the time, in Florence, there was a system of fractional reserve free banking, with no central bank. No one could save the banks. They all went under. Mortality rate? 100%. People went to withdraw their money and it was gone. The banks failed. Bankruptcy. The bench where bankers did business was broken. Their property was sought and sold to pay their debts. There was a process of credit tightening, just like the one we are now experiencing. In the documents we read of a mancamento della credenza, or a credit shortage. The documents of the period inform us that banks paid only in ink. In other words, they had no cash to return to people. They paid only in promissory notes. Businesses failed when banks were unable to return loans. Businesses failed when banks were unable to return loans. An extremely deep economic recession hit. It was similar to that of the fall of the Roman Empire. Moreover, it coincided with the dreadful time of the plague. The age of the Canticle of the Sun gave way to the age of the Dance Macabre. Also very fortunate for us was the 1950 discovery of the secret records of the Medici Bank in the State Archives of Florence. These secret books have enabled us to analyze and study in detail the actions of the Medici family, who were very prominent bankers, who also ended up going bankrupt, because they operated with a fractional reserve ratio. It fell as low as 10%. So, we are very fortunate because we have historical studies which show that banks acted fraudulently, and analyses which explain the financial crisis of the 14th century in the Mediterranean world in general, and in Italian cities, especially Florence in particular.